Well, hi everyone. Uh, happy Sunday. Um, we're continuing our series going through the four Gospels for the year of 2020. And we, uh, we're in week three this week of the Gospel of Luke. So I hope you're excited to study Luke together this morning. Um, uh, we're in the second major section of Luke. Last week we looked at the introductory section, which is the birth narrative. It's a very familiar part of Luke um, uh, with the shepherds and the birth in a manger and the story of Zechariah and Mary. So this week we move into um, a series in the wilderness. Um, uh, this is a section that is in all three uh, synoptic gospels. They all include a section like this um, that, that includes two elements. Uh, first is the ministry of uh, John the Baptist. And then second is the preparation of Jesus Christ for his ministry. And that comes in uh, through the baptism of Jesus and through the temptation. Um, so that's what we're looking at today. It'll be all of chapter 3 and 4 uh, through the first 13 verses of chapter 4. So let me pray for us and we'll get started this morning. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to study the Gospels together. We thank you uh, so much that you have preserved these four pictures of Jesus um, so that we can fully understand him, uh, understand who we are supposed to be as his disciples, and also understand all that you have done for us through his life. So be with us today as we look at these opening um, stories of Jesus as he's getting prepared for ministry. Um, help us to understand and see uh, what we can learn from the ministry of John the Baptist, and then help us see clearly what we can learn from Luke's unique telling of the baptism and the temptation of Jesus Christ. Uh, I pray for your blessings on everyone watching this study and that you would be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, um, uh, there's three things that we're going to basically be looking at today. Um, that are unique about Luke's account. So we talked about Luke is the longest gospel, so we can't possibly cover every verse of Luke. It's 24 chapters, very long chapters in some cases. Um, and so what we're mainly wanting to do is look at the unique elements of Luke so that we can see the unique picture that it gives us of Jesus Christ. Now, we've been talking that that unique picture is as the perfect human being um, that can mediate between God and man. So in that way, he is our great high priest, and he is the savior of the world. So last week we saw Luke introducing a lot of themes, the themes of outsiders, uh, or those who are considered outsiders being insiders of the kingdom, and those who seem like insiders being outsiders, and so on and so forth. There's lots of themes in Luke, and we'll continue to see those be developed. But where we're going to start uh, this week is with the ministry of John the Baptist, and uh, Luke gives us a much deeper look at the ministry of John the Baptist than the other uh, gospel writers. Um, he gives us more of what his message was, and he also uh, tells us earlier than the other gospel writers about the fate of John the Baptist, that he ends up uh, going to prison and being executed. Uh, and then probably the weirdest thing about the section we're in today for Luke is he tells the story of Jesus' baptism, and we're going to look at that, and the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. But in between those two stories, between the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus, Luke inserts a genealogy for Jesus. Now, Matthew also includes a genealogy, but he includes it where you would expect to see it, right at the first, right? This is uh, about Jesus, and then he lists off the genealogy of the generations that have, have come to, uh, to produce Jesus. But, but Luke does something very unusual. Matter of fact, I, don't, I, I dare you to find any biography where people wait until the person is 30 years old, and then in the middle of the stories of their life, they insert the genealogy. Uh, so why, why? This, this is the question I wanna encourage you to ask as you read the scriptures. Why is the genealogy in between the baptism and temptation of Jesus. I think there's a very good reason, and we're gonna see that today, but the genealogy, now the genealogies, right, whether they're in the Old or New Testament, are easy for us to ignore. It seems like um, boring information to list off the generations that produced um, Jesus or anyone in the scriptures, but they are very important in the scriptures because they establish um, the fact that God has kept his promises 
and then they also um, serve a function. And so we're going to see Matthew's has a function uh, when we get to Matthew, um, but Luke has a very specific function with this genealogy. And so uh, we're going to see that today. So that's probably the strangest thing we're going to do. Why did uh, Luke insert a genealogy for Jesus between the baptism and the temptation? Okay, so let's start in uh, the first 20 verses of uh, chapter 3, which is the introduction of John the Baptist's ministry. Now, when, uh, when Luke introduces John the Baptist, he actually lists off seven different rulers that were ruling at the time, either religious or political rulers. Uh, he says, in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor, while Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria, and Trachonitis, uh, and uh, Lysanias um, was tetrarch of Abilene, and during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So he gives us seven names. Now, um, if you've read much of the Old Testament, you know that it's not unusual when a prophetic person is introduced, when somebody in the role of prophet is introduced, for them to say who the kings were at that time, right? During the reign of so-and-so, Jeremiah began to minister, right? Or something like that. So one thing he's clearly doing, right, is following in the Old Testament tradition of introducing a prophet um, in the, the historical context uh, by listing off these things. So it's connecting John um, with the prophets that have come before in the Old Testament. But he lists off more rulers than anybody in any occurrence in the Old Testament. He lists off seven different key figures that were reigning at that time. So what is Luke saying by introducing the story of John the Baptist that way? I think he's saying that this is the most significant moment in redemptive history. So he is marking it very precisely with these seven rulers. Now, these seven rulers did reign all at the same time, but not overlapping for very long, right? Uh, for all of these to be in place at one time, he's marking the moment of John the Baptist's ministry beginning as a key moment in redemptive history. Now, one of the reasons it's a key moment is that it's been 400 years since there was a prophet uh, in uh, Israel uh, speaking on behalf of God. And so, uh, so he's marking this as a moment in history. But, but then also, John the Baptist's prophetic ministry is the most important prophetic ministry that's ever happened in the history of the world because he is announcing uh, the ministry of Jesus, the, ba uh, Jesus uh, the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of all God's promises that were, have been made before. So John's ministry is a key moment in redemptive history. And uh, he quotes from the Old Testament, just like Mark does, um, that we saw before. He quotes Isaiah um, 40, which is an introduction of what's called the Book of Comfort, um, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, one thing that's different about his quotes than the other is, is he includes a longer block uh, that ends with, and everyone will see the salvation of God. And so Luke uh, is keeping with his theme, he includes more of that quote to say, John the Baptist's ministry is inaugurating a moment of God keeping his promise that everyone will see the salvation of God. So that helps us. It helps us understand the ministry of John, which is to prepare for the coming salvation that God has promised. Um, the other thing is that we see that God's salvation is not reserved for a particular group. Um, so the crowds are coming uh, to John, and we're going to look at the content of his message to them. But one of the things you may not have noticed is there are different kinds of crowds coming to him. Um, there are crowds that are coming to him uh, that are uh, religious leaders, right, that are coming out to him. There are people coming to him who are uh, soldiers. There are people coming to him who are common people. Um, uh, uh, he speaks to... Um, tax collectors, right? And he speaks to, um, uh, let's see, yeah, tax collectors and soldiers and, and to the religious leaders. So uh, John wants, I mean, Mark, uh, sorry, Luke wants you to see that the ministry of John is not reserved for one group of people. It's not, he didn't come to speak to those that are in religious communities. He didn't come just to even speak to Jews. John's ministry is to prepare for 
uh, the coming of God's salvation uh, is for everyone. Um, now, the main heart of, God, of John's message, all, all three gospel writers tell us, which is turn from sin and prepare um, to meet the Lord. It's a message of repentance. However, Luke gives us more of the content of that message than anyone else. Uh, most of uh, the other gospel writers just tell us that John came preaching repentance. But, but Luke includes what exactly he was saying. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. He said to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Don't start saying to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit, fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. And then these different groups come and ask John, well, what do we do? What do we do to get ready? And he gives them each a contextual answer to their life. Um, at how they can repent and begin to live in a way uh, that will help them be ready to meet the Lord. So repentance is the heart, but, but it's very interesting that he includes the content because he says, um, remember you are warned that judgment is eventually going to come. So you need to repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance, which means you, you've changed. You, you, your, your life reflects that I'm not sinning anymore and I'm, I'm uh, obeying the Lord. But then he also says, don't say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Now, why does he include that? Well, he's addressing what is the biggest reason, the biggest obstacle for the Jewish people to not repent. Why would they not repent? Because they believe as descendants of Abraham, they're in a favored category. And so they're fine. God will come for them because they are Israelites, because they are children of Abraham. And he says that does not matter at all. God could raise up children of Abraham from stones. There is no favored category that does not need to prepare their hearts for, Je for Jesus, for the coming of God's salvation through repentance. Now, why is this important? I, I did this devotional on this particular passage with my kids. And it took them a while. We, we, we worked on trying to figure out, well, what, what is he saying? And of course, when we got to these verses, I said to them, this is really relevant to you as children of a pastor. You know, you could think that I'm okay with God because my dad is a preacher and, and I'm in a Christian family and, and I'm gonna get to go to heaven because my dad it serves Jesus, right? My dad is a pastor. That is completely a lie of the enemy. What I do and what anybody else does other than you matters nothing when it comes to your readiness to meet God. It's all about whether you have repented and believed in Jesus Christ. And you're walking in that way, right? You're walking, putting to death sin, and living to Jesus Christ in obedience. So he points out, don't trust your heritage. Don't trust the fact that you grew up as a Christian. Don't trust the fact that you're in church. Don't trust the fact that my granddaddy was a pastor. Don't trust anything other than the fact that your heart is humble and repentant and walking faithfully and ready to meet Jesus. Now, why um, do they need to prepare themselves? Well, we're gonna see in the gospel and all, all three, uh, all four of the Gospels, actually, we see that those whose hearts aren't ready, whose hearts already are not repentant of sin and owning their sin and seeking to turn away from it, they will look at Jesus and say, who do you think you are? We're descendants from Abraham. We're, we're fine with God. Who do you think you are to tell us these things and to tell us that you're bringing in something new from the Lord? So that penitent, uh, impoverished heart of repentance is what will ready them to see Jesus and believe in faith. Okay, so uh, so John comes preaching repentance, and uh, he also comes proclaiming one who will come, a mediator of God's salvation, who is Jesus. Some wondered whether John the Baptist himself was the Messiah, 
But all four Gospels tell us clearly that he denied that. He was merely the forerunner uh, to the true bringer of God's salvation. He talks about someone that won't baptize just with water, but will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, that may be a weird image for you, Holy Spirit and fire. Um, but fire, right, was an emblem um, of the presence of God, right? It was an emblem. They were led by a pillar of fire. Of course, we see in the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they all saw little flames of fire uh, above their head, the image of that. So uh, the Holy Spirit and with fire is a coming of the refining work of the Holy Spirit, the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. And he basically says, the person who's coming after me, I'm not fit um, to even untie his sandals. He, he is so much greater than I am. So, so John is a forerunner um, to God's salvation coming through Jesus, who will baptize in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, Luke is the only one um, that tells us at this point what happens to John later on. And of course, we know it doesn't happen at this particular moment. Um, but what we see is, is that he foreshadows or t uh, foretells us that um, John is going to be uh, uh, rebuked by Herod. Um, and, uh, and then he gets locked. I mean, sorry, he's going to rebuke Herod and he's going to get locked up in prison. So I think Luke includes that early because he wants you to see that John's ministry is fulfilled once Jesus comes on the scene. So he wants you to see in that moment, okay, John's ministry goes to the background and, um, and Jesus's ministry comes to the forefront. Um, and so that's, so you know, um, John's ministry isn't going to continue uh, as a prophet. Um, so he just tells you right there. Okay, so that's his uh, telling of the ministry of John the Baptist. It's incredibly important. And I think the biggest takeaway is that um, if we want to be ready to see Jesus and to understand him and to believe, we have to have penitent hearts. We have to be readying ourselves to hate our sin and to turn away from it. Um, and of course, that conviction, that work happens through the Holy Spirit. Um, but John is, is proclaiming that. And one of the obstacles to that is putting ourselves in some sort of favored category. I'm a good person. Uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a descendant of, of faithful people, you know, whatever. Putting yourself in a favored category and neglecting repentance. Neglecting repentance because you think, I I'm okay. Um, uh, so uh, that was the ministry of John the Baptist. Next, we see him give us a very, very short account, a very short account of the baptism of Jesus. Uh, it's only two verses, um, and, it, and it's not nearly as long as, as Mark's or Matthew's that, that give us more details of the baptism. But basically, in verses 21 and 22, he says, When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him, uh, in a physical appearance like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And so the elements of Jesus' baptism are the same in all three synoptic gospels. Uh, it tells us that uh, there's a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit descending upon him. So what is that? Well, that's showing you Jesus' anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had already been on Jesus um, and been involved in his life. But this is not uh, uh, the first coming of the Holy Spirit into his life. This is an anointing of the Holy Spirit for ministry, right? So, so you have the Holy Spirit anointing him, preparing him for ministry. Now, Luke puts more of an emphasis on the Holy Spirit than the other gospel writers. He also tells us much more uh, about Jesus's prayer life. And you may have heard that in, in, uh, in this baptism account. He's the only one that says, it was while Jesus was praying right after his baptism. So he comes up from the water and, he, and he's praying to the Lord. That's when the Spirit of God descends. And so it's in the midst of prayer and it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The second element they all, all the gospel writers tell us is the voice from heaven. The voice from heaven. And uh, the voice from heaven uh, says, This is my beloved Son. Now, the title, Son of God, is an important one for all the gospel writers as a beloved son. Um, 
because it connects uh, it connects Jesus to the hopes of the Old Testament. You may remember the Davidic covenant that uh, God promised David that one of his descendants would reign uh, over his kingdom forever, and that descendant would be a son to him, to God, would be a son to him. There's also Psalms, like Psalm 2, uh, that are talking about um, God's son. So there are messianic expectations that are tied to this title, Son of God. So the fact that a voice from heaven is saying, this is my beloved son, is a divine confirmation that Jesus is the fulfillment of those hopes and expectations. Now, uh, as the Son of God, Jesus is also the fulfillment of what human beings were designed to be. Now, you may remember, I'm sure you remember, in Genesis 1, we are created in the imago Dei, the image of God, right, as a Son of God. What you may not remember is after the fall, right, um, Adam... Uh, is described as a son of God, right? And then um, uh, who's made in the image of God. Adam is described that way. But then when the genealogy of Seth comes up, right? The descendants of Adam that come through Seth. He says, Seth, who was in the image of Adam, right? So all the descendants carry the Imago Dei, but they also carry the image of the fall, right? The mark of the fall, Um, And so, uh, to be a son of God is to be a human being, but to be a human being is also carrying uh, with us the sin nature. And so Luke sees something in this title that I think is very important. And the way we know he sees something in this title is because after this short account of the baptism, Luke includes a genealogy for Jesus. Now, I'm not going to read this. (laughs) It would be very long and, and tedious. Um, but we're going to make a few comments about this genealogy. Um, it, is, it includes all generations that go back. We don't know for sure if he's tracking the genealogy of um, Joseph uh, himself or of Mary's family. We're not 100% sure. Um, but uh, uh, what we do know is that unlike Matthew, so, so Matthew's genealogy highlights Uh, three individual moments in redemptive history. It it highlights the exile, right? There's 14 generations between Jesus and the exile, by the way uh, Matthew constructs his genealogy. And then it highlights David. There's 14 generations between the exile and David. And then it highlights Abraham. There's 14 generations between David and Abraham. And so he constructs his genealogy to show you Jesus is the fulfillment of, of the promises to Abraham and the Davidic promises, and he's the fulfillment of um, of what he promised he would do to those in exile, which is to bring uh, salvation. And so uh, Matthew constructs his genealogy to show you that the history of, of Jesus's uh, lineage actually confirms that God is keeping all of his promises. That's the purpose of his genealogy. Uh, Luke does not highlight any particular generation. He doesn't show us that symmetry. He doesn't highlight anybody. They're all just listed son of, son of, son of, son of. But one thing that he does that's dramatically different than the Gospel of Matthew is he keeps going um, past Abraham. Okay, so so Abraham, he tracks him all the way back um, from Abraham, uh, I think another 20 or so generations, to Adam. And the last words of Luke's genealogy is Jesus was a son of Adam, son of God. So if you ask, well, why is Luke including this after the baptism? The answer is um, because he's establishing. So, So the voice from heaven just said, this is my beloved son. And Luke is using the genealogy to say, uh, yes, he is a human being that's descended all the way back from Adam, who was a son of God. So he's, he, that uh, title, beloved son, or son of God, is the reason he says this is the good place to put the genealogy to show that Jesus Christ is a descendant from the original created man. He is a human being. 
And of course, all the promises in the Old Testament were that a son was going to come, a child was going to come, who would eventually be um, the one who brings salvation and hope for all people. Now, the other thing, by going all the way back to Adam, instead of stopping at Abraham, again, Luke is emphasizing one of his main themes in the gospel, which Jesus is the savior of all people. So not just the descendants of Abraham. He goes back to Adam to show you he's the descendants of everybody who's a child of Adam, which is all of us, okay? Now, what happens in the creation account after we learn about Adam being created in the image of God? Well, the answer is the fall, right? So as soon as Adam and Eve are created and given the garden, they are tempted and they fall into sin. So that's another reason I think Luke includes the genealogy right here. Here we see a new son of God, a new Adam, right? A new descendant of, of the human race, a new Adam. And let's see what's going to happen when he gets tempted just the way Adam and Eve were. Okay? So right after this account, um, we get the account of Jesus's temptation. Now, uh, Luke and Matthew give us much more detail on the, the temptation of Jesus than Mark does. And of course, Luke, uh, John does not include it at all. Uh, Mark just tells us that, um, that Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness for temp to be tempted, and he was there for 40 days being tempted, and angels ministered to him. But it doesn't tell us what was the temptations, right? How was Jesus tempted? Um, Matthew and Luke both do. They both tell us that Jesus was tempted three times in three different ways by Satan himself who came to him and tempted him. Uh, and so the, the account of the, uh, uh, the temptation of Jesus is much longer in Matthew and Luke uh, than it is in Mark. Okay, so let's look at the account of the temptation of Jesus because there's some wonderful things to learn there. So first, all of the, um, all of the, uh, uh, the Gospels tell us that Jesus is, goes out into the wilderness after his baptism because the Spirit of God wanted him there. So let, let me look how, how uh, Jesus, uh, or how Luke writes it. So in verse 1, Then Jesus left the Jordan, the Jordan River where he was baptized, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. So the first thing we see about this temptation is it was clearly the will of God that Jesus would be tempted. This isn't something that's happening because he made a mistake or he's not where he's supposed to be. Exactly the opposite. Jesus is being tempted as a direct um, aspect of the will of God for him. And, and that's the truth for all human beings. It's the will of God that human beings face temptation. Why? Um, because this is the way that God reveals in temptation what's in our hearts so that we can uh, uh, come to him, so that we can change, so that we can be helped. So why does Jesus need to do it? Well, it's to reveal what his, is in his heart and to strengthen him. So the wilderness is a place of testing, right, to see what's in your heart, but it's also a place of strengthening. And so all the way back in the scriptures, the wilderness is always a place of testing and of strengthening for the journey ahead, that God is teaching us in the wilderness. And so Jesus has to go through the same thing. Um, uh, though we never want to face temptation, we never, you know, it's in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, right? We don't desire it. Um, uh, and Jesus tells us to pray that we don't enter into seasons of temptation, we understand that God does lead us into seasons of testing and temptation according to his good plan for us in order to reveal what's going on in our hearts, to test us, right, and in order to develop us so that we can be of greater use for his glory. And so that's why Jesus is going into the wilderness. It's because God uh, sends him there. Okay, the second thing we see is temptation come to Jesus in three forms. Um, the first temptation is, uh, uh, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. 
Okay, so that's the first temptation. The second temptation is, um, uh, I will give you the splendor, and uh, he, he shows, uh, the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, and he says, I'll give you all the splendor and all the authority because it's all been given over to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, all these kingdoms will be yours. So that's the second temptation. The third temptation is he takes him to Jerusalem and has him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot upon a stone. So Satan quotes from scripture there. Um, so uh, those are the three temptations. Now, one of the differences of the three temptations from Matthew is the order. So uh, Matthew's order is, uh, is it's the same first one, but he switches. The, the other two are switched. So, uh, so Luke intentionally includes this order. And I personally, we don't have a way to prove this, that Luke actually changed the chronological order for, of these three temptations to this for a reason. So let me explain why I think they're in this order. And that is in the original story of the fall in Genesis 3, Eve was tempted um, to, uh, to eat from the forbidden fruit, to disobey God. And this is what it says. So the woman, this is in Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So the order of, uh, in, in Genesis 3, the order that she was tempted is the lust of the flesh. She saw the tree that it was good for food, right? So that's, she was hungry, she wanted it, and it looked like this fruit is gonna be satisfying. The Bible calls that the lust of the flesh. The second is uh, that it was a delight to the eyes. In other words, it was appealing. It was appealing to her in the way she perceived it. And the Bible calls this the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And then the third thing it says is, and that the tree was, was to be desired to make one wise. So the Bible calls this the pride of life. In other words, she wanted to be independently wise so that God couldn't command her and withhold from her. So she doubted God's wisdom so that she could become independently wise. Well, that's called the pride of life. And the Bible talks about temptation coming in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So the order in Luke is exactly that. Make stones into bread. That's the lust of the flesh. Look at, he takes him to uh, a place where he can look at all the kingdoms of the world and says, I'll give you all of this if you'll worship me. That's the lust of the eyes, right? And then third, he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, jump off of here. Everyone will see uh, when the angels catch you that you are the son of man, you are the son of God. So jump off of here and put God to the test. Put his uh, commands to you to the test um, by jumping off of here. That's the pride of life. So G, uh, uh, I think Luke wants you to see that this is the son of Adam. This is a new human being, son of God, son of Adam, and he's being tempted in the exact same ways that Adam and Eve were tempted and failed. So the question is, is he going to fail? Now, it's very helpful for you to understand that temptations come to you in these three categories, okay? Um, there's your fleshly desires. There's... Um, uh, walking by sight instead of by faith in what God has said, right? And there's pride, right? There's there's acting in my own self-interest instead of what God says is good or right. It's very helpful for you to know that that's Satan. There's nothing new under the sun. Satan always tempts in those three categories. But what's Jesus's technique? What's Jesus's technique for overcoming temptation? It's the same every time. He quotes the Word of God, and he trusts in the Word of God. So all temptation can be overcome by knowing the Word and by the Spirit of God, by the empowerment of the Spirit of God, trusting God at his Word. 
So in Jesus' temptation, the first one, when he said, turn this stone into bread, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy, man does not live on bread alone. And of course, the rest of that verse is, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Uh, in the second temptation, when he's offered all the kingdoms of the world, if he'll, bow, if he'll worship him, uh, he again quotes from uh, the Old Testament, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Uh, and then in the third case, where he's told to go onto the pinnacle of the temple and jump off, uh, he quotes again from the Old Testament, uh, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. And it says, after that, the devil had finished tempting him, he departed from him for a time. So Jesus is tempted in the exact series in the exact three ways that Adam and Eve were tempted. And where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus succeeded because he relied on the word of God and the spirit of God was upon him, strengthening him so that he could stand up under temptation. Psalm 119.11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You. It was a memory verse when I was a kid, right? I stored up my, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the temptations we face come in the same forms all the time, and yet we can stand up to them if we write the word of God in our hearts and we walk in the Spirit, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so John's ministry, that's the end of uh, our text today. John's ministry was a key moment in redemptive history. It was a voice in the wilderness that Isaiah had predicted 700 years before. His message was a call to repentance, not to trust in anything that puts you in some sort of favored condition, but that everyone, everyone needed to repent and prepare their hearts to receive Jesus. Jesus is a new Adam. He is a new human being that gives us a new head that does not have a sin nature, did not fall to sin. He was tempted and tried in all the ways that we uh, have been tempted and tried, yet did not sin. He is a new Adam. He is the Son of God who did not rebel against God. In his sinlessness, there is hope for salvation through him. As our anointed pre uh, high priest, he can go before God on our behalf and mediate uh, God's grace for us. So Hebrews 4 I'll close with this, 14 and 15. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted, just as we are, yet without sin. Praise God. Father, we thank you for a great high priest. We thank you that Jesus, as he faced the temptations that all of us face, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that he stood confidently upon your word. And where every one of us has fallen, Jesus stayed faithful to you. And now his righteousness can clothe us as we put our faith in him. We rejoice in that today. I ask that you would help us to be good, faithful ambassadors of this grace, to celebrate it with our families, and to proclaim it to our friends and neighbors. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, there's devotionals in the notes. The notes, by the way, if you have not gotten them off of Facebook, are linked in the description of the video right below. Um, and so you can get the notes there. And uh, uh, the notes have a devotional schedule for the coming week. Uh, which I hope will be an encouragement to you as we study Luke together. Thanks, and uh, I look forward to seeing many of you and talking to you again soon. God bless.